Hello and welcome to Fueling Around with me, Jason Plato, and my very own safety car. It's obviously Dave Vitti. Hello. Fueling Around is powered by Adrian Flux as the UK's largest specialist insurance broker. Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help you save your money on your car, your bike, or even your home insurance. Dave, how are you, mate? You look a bit peaky, if I might say. Well, I might have a little bit of a bug, Jason Plato. I think, uh, oh, have you heard no. of this bug that's going around at the moment? No, no. It's called... No, not COVID? Yeah, I think I might have just tested positive for that. So if I sound a little bit more nasal <laughs> than I normally do, that'll be why. Are you sure this isn't just a ruse because you were out last night? No, I promise you. I promise you, promise you, promise you. I tested positive for COVID on Saturday morning. At the time of recording, it is Monday morning, Monday the 13th of December. And uh, and yeah, so I've been holed up in bed. Uh, it's a good job, actually, that we now record these podcasts remotely, because if we didn't, then obviously <laughs> you'd be flying solo this morning uh, with our special guest for the week. And I tell you what, um, we couldn't have timed this any better. Unbelievable, isn't it? This is inspired booking. <laughs> well, I mean, it is incredible. Our special guest today is a gentleman who's had a distinguished racing career in Formula One and Formula E and a whole host of other stuff. And he now presents... He's my co-presenter on Fifth Gear Recharge, and he also covers F1 for Sky, which is why, as you say, he's an inspired booking this week. It is, of course, the one and only, my mate, Karun Chandra. Hello, mate. How are you? H- hello. Um, yeah, I'm quite tired, if I'm perfectly honest. It's been a, it's been a mentally exhausting weekend out in Abu Dhabi Do, and uh, I landed back at Heathrow two hours ago, and here I am. I, I can't believe you're back. I can't believe you're back already. Well, I had to come back for your podcast, JP. You know, the good abuse lad. I would have got if I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> He's good, isn't he? I mean, that's proper jet fresh, Karun. I mean, we've never had a guest quite as jet fresh as that. Yeah, that's because Plato's normally had the G&Ts the night before. So, you know. Well, order, order. That's right. <laughs> uh, no, listen, it's, it's, uh, it's great to be here. There's just so many thoughts flying around the internet, flying around all of our heads. I'm sure we've all watched and rewatched and tried to relive what happened last night. Um, Come on, give us your take. Give us your take. Don't sit on the fence. My take on the finish? Yeah. Well, mm. I, th- I think, to be honest, it was messy. Or massy. Yeah, oh, good one. <laughs> uh, yeah, COVID hasn't entered your humour. Has <laughs> uh, um, I, I think, personally, they, they should have done two other things, really. Either they should have red flagged the race and had a four-lap sprint to the finish on fresh set of tyres, and then it's a straight fight, right? You know, yeah. best driver wins. It, they both standing star, Lewis on pole because he was leading the race, and a straight fight. Or B, they should have let the lapped cars stay between Lewis and Max. Uh, and then I think it still would have been very exciting because Max would have cleared those five cars probably in the first half of the lap. Um, mm. And then we have had an unbelievable final half lap of the race because he would have had, you know, the fresh soft tyres two, three seconds a lap quicker than the tyres Lewis had, and they would have they would have gone for it till the last corner. So yeah. I think we would have still had a very exciting finish in both of those scenarios, but it would have felt a little bit more fair to Lewis, who yeah. you know, did a, a brilliant job dominating that race until that last safety car. So what time did you leave the paddock last night then? Half past 10. That's local time. Yeah, sorry, half past 10 local time when they were just hmm. coming out of the steward's room. Um just intense. It, it, it was weird because, you know, Red Bull were celebrating and, and trying to be happy and celebrate. But then we kept getting news that, you know, they're going back to the stewards and Christian and Adrian had to go back into the stewards with Jonathan Wheatley, the team manager. And then you saw, you know, Mercedes are obviously absolutely crestfallen because mm. until Latifi's crash, they had the championship. You know, yeah. it, it was there that, you know, the champagne was on ice ready to go. And To be fair to Mercedes and Lewis, they started the season on the back foot. They started the year probably three tenths behind Red Bull. And they've done an unbelievable job. If you look at the last four Grand Prix, they had the fastest car on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. And that's an amazing turnaround. And and Lewis showed his quality as well. So I I thought out of everything that unfolded at the end of the race, you know, obviously Toto was furious and the engineers and Mercedes absolutely distraught. I thought Lewis was incredible in the way he handled it. Yeah, me too. Special human being, that guy, you know. I mean, just an example, right, to any young racing driver, young Mm -hmm. sportsman, frankly, um, in how to be magnanimous in defeat. The way he 
he handle it? Um, you know, we saw Anthony Hamilton, his dad, going to congratulate Yoss and Max straight, yeah. even before the podium, in fact. And I thought that was... Yeah, sheer class, that. Class. Yeah, real class, real class. So what happens now then, do you think? As you say, we have to keep stating the fact that this is Monday the 13th and obviously the podcast will then air on the 15th. So there is the chance that stuff might date here. But what is your feeling, Corinne, in terms of what may happen in the next 48 hours, for example? Look, so Mercedes have a point, which is they believe, the regulations say that any lapped cars have to be released to go past the the safety car right mm-hmm. and it's not selective so what's happened here is obviously five cars were selected to go past and not the other three which was ricardo stroll and schumacher mm-hmm. so that's their first point is listen you can't pick and choose who who gets that past and it is unprecedented i, I mean certainly i can't remember it happening mm-hmm. yeah. so the other point they've got is somewhere in the rules uh, and i can't remember the article off the top of my head but i believe it says that when the lap cars get let past, the racing will resume on the following lap. Yeah. And again, that didn't happen. Racing resumed on, you know, at the end of that current lap. Mm-hmm. Now, the FIA have said, listen, the primary objective was to get racing up and running. We wanted to finish the race and the World Championship under green flag racing conditions. That was their motivation, which I understand. You know, yeah. none of us want to see the World Championship finish under a yellow flag. It's a bit of a damp squib. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, I can't see the result being overturned. I just can't. You know, the, the stewards dismissed it saying, you know, if they went with what Mercedes wanted, which was a count back to a couple of laps, that effectively shortens the race distance, right? And then, mm, yeah, you know, that affects people like Sonoda who finished fourth. And there's, there's, there's a whole load of complications like that. You can't just shorten the race. And I mean, there is no solution, is there? And that's why I don't think anything will happen. And I think Max will remain world champion. But look, at the end of the day, both of them deserve to be world champion. They, yeah. they, they've done an outstanding job. Um, you know, I talked about Lewis before coming from behind the start of the year. But look at Max, right? 18 podiums. There's a record in Formula 1. He's beaten Schumacher's record, beaten Lewis's is that, record. Is that right? I didn't know that. 18 podiums out of 22 races. And in every one of those, he's finished first or second. Wow. That's astonishing, isn't it? It's astonishing. The guy's, you know, he started the year off being 23 years old. He's now 24. Mm. He And the races he didn't finish were obviously Silverstone, Monza, where they collided. Bottas wiped him out in Budapest. Yeah. And the tyre blew in Baku when he was comfortably yeah. looking on course mm. to win. So it, it's funny because I'm, I'm about to write a column about picking my top 10 for the season, <laughs> which is a really tough thing to do, to be honest, every year. Uh, and this year is harder than any because... You can make a strong case for Lewis or Max, but ultimately, I do think Max, given the fact that he handled the pressure of going for his first world championship mm. so well, the only mistake he made really was that qualifying lap in Saudi Arabia at the last corner when he hit the wall. Silverstone, I think that was a mistake. He didn't give. He didn't give. He, I think if he was a few years older. He wouldn't. He wouldn't have done what he did at Silverstone. He would have given it. He would have yielded. Give give Lewis a bit of space, and he would have come second. And actually, then he would have turned up at Abu Dhabi, miles in the lead, cruise home for a championship. Do you think? But I don't classify that as a mistake. I, I just classify that ultimately. I think Lewis was the one who went in there hot and deep, missed the apex, and understeer wide. I don't disagree with you. I do think if I was in Max's situation, I would have given another car's width. I, yeah. I don't get me wrong. But I, I don't think you can say that was a mistake. That you know, Max races in the way Michael used to race. He's very uncompromising, and he wasn't going to compromise. Absolutely. But I think a few more years on him, he, he'll look at that and think, actually, hold on, and he'll just round himself off, and he could he could become the greatest ever. Well, this is what I was going to suggest, actually, because of his age. You know, he was only seventeen when he started, was he not? And so he's now what twenty three, twenty four. In terms of actually being that good, yeah. that young, I mean, he's got the potential to go on to be the greatest of all time. Yeah. But he's won his first championship a year before Michael won his, hasn't he? And Michael mm-hmm. went on to win seven. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it is entirely possible. I think the other thing you've got to think about is this season for me, you know, now that we've mentioned Michael, for me, this is the season we should have had in 1994 yeah, when yeah. you had Schumacher versus Senna. And, yeah. and we were all tragically denied that. You know, you had the this young, hungry, aggressive, uncompromising yeah. pretender to the king's crown yeah. and 
uh, we never saw that play out, whereas this year we we did. And Mate, I think you're bang on there. I think that you've hit the nail right on the head. And, and you know the, the the intensity. I mean, I was obviously you know in the paddock, and you're talking to the team owners and you know, the drivers and the engineers. The intensity of this year goes back to Michael and Damon. Really, you know, mm. if you look at Schumacher and Hakkinen. It was pretty. It was pretty cordial. You know, they had a couple of moments, but it was pretty cordial. Yeah. Fernando and Michael was was again very friendly. Um, you know, there was an edge between Lewis and Fernando, of course, when they were teammates. <laughs> but ultimately, Kimi won the championship, yeah. and Kimi was fine with either. You know, and and the following year, Lewis and Felipe got on fine. You know, we never had this level of almost animosity between the two camps, Un- unless you go back to the, the Prost and Williams Senna. days. And then before that, obviously, Prost Senna, and then you go Mansell PK, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, That's great for the sport, though, surely. Oh, man. I mean, our viewing figures this year have been off the chart. I bet. I bet. Because you need to have, I think, you know, almost in any sport, you need to have that rivalry. Sport is all about rivalry and to have the two pretenders to the crown, if you like, you know, whoever that might be. And as you say, there's various different pairings that we've discussed over history. And actually now to have this pairing in 2021 is as good as anything we've, we've seen. Yeah. I, I was led to believe by someone at F1 that yesterday's race would be the highest watch Formula One race in history worldwide. Not 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 the UK necessarily, but if you look at it worldwide, yeah, that was that would have been the highest watch race in F1 history. Well, do you know what? I've just had a conversation with Ke- Kevin Turner today, who's the um, the chief editor of Autosport, and he, he said this this weekend he's had calls uh, from from like uni mates who are not interested in mo- motorsport. His wife watched it, and she can't stand motorsport. So I think <laughs> actually it's drawn in a whole new audience, which are fresh to it because it was so exciting. I think. Yeah, and listen, that has a trickle down effect, Jason, doesn't it? To to everyone in the sport, it doesn't mm. matter whether it's it's touring cars or Formula Three. You know, it doesn't matter what category it is. I think if if people are interested in F one, they suddenly become interested in motor racing, and there's a it starts with F one. You know, it's you saw it in the nineties, right? You know, when yeah, yeah. when you had the era of, of Big Nige and Damon. <laughs> The UK went mad for it, and therefore you guys in the touring car world benefited. I think you know yeah. you had big crowds and manufacturers, etc. Because there's a, there's a hunger for motor racing, and uh, I think we're, we're seeing that. You know, we're seeing. Uh, you look in the US when we went to Austin, the guys from ESPN were saying they were up nearly thirty percent their viewership. Is that right? Mm. And um, you know, we at Sky this year our viewership was double what it was in 2018 good lord wow. double double what it was in 2018 that is incredible wow. isn't it yeah hey dave you know we mentioned big knives then yes do you know what car he's driven Karun, a few times actually only red five Oh, really? He's driven it. It's a screensaver on my phone. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine what that must be like? Tell us. Come on, Karoo. T- tell us. Probably one of the greatest race cars ever, isn't it? You've got to say it's in the top five, haven't you? It's yeah. got to be right up there in the top five. I mean, you know, you just listen to the, the list of people who are there building that car. Patrick Head, Adrian Newey, Paddy Lowe, Jeff Willis. You know, incredible. And then when we think of the British Grand Prix, yeah, you know, most people, their first thought, of a, if you're of a certain generation, is big Nige driving down, hangar yeah. straight, yeah. crowd going mental, crowd invasion, blah, blah, blah. And, and that was it. And, you know, for me, that was the image I grew up watching as a kid. So I got to drive, as you said, the car on several occasions. The most special was at the British Grand Prix weekend in 2017. Um, you know, Silverstone gave us t- track time so i drove it on saturday evening after qualifying and then sunday morning with the whole crowd there before oh the grand prix I, I did some demo laps and, and it, it sh- you know you're going on hangar straight and it's like i could hear murray walker's voice in my head as you're going yeah. down the store <laughs> corner that you know that view as you're looking you know through through the front uh, of mm. that car it was exactly as i remember it as, as a kid watching it on tv so but it, you know a car design obviously in 92 active suspension a blown diffuser, traction control, launch control. You know, it had all the tricks and they designed it on (laughs) MS-DOS. It's it's, Mm. uh, it's, it's just, um, so yeah, emotionally the the best driving experience I've ever had in my life. And I know I've been very lucky. I've driven 26 different Formula One cars. So Karun, take us back to the beginning then. Where did it all start for you? I know that you're 
your father was into motor racing. Your grandfather, I believe, was also into motor racing. So was it a given that you were going to follow in their footsteps and have a career in cars? I don't think it was a given. You know, they, they both raced and rallied a lot. My grandmother did some racing as well in the 70s. Is um, that right? Wow. Yeah. But I, it wasn't a given and, and nor did they push me into it. You know, for example, mm-hmm. my brother has no interest in motor racing. He played cricket and, you know, he, okay. he's he's got no real interest in motor racing apart from obviously watches it now and he, mm, mm. you know, he, he came to some of my races and things like that. Um, but I just loved it. You know, as a kid growing up, I, I grew up around cars. We, we, you know, my dad sort of stopped racing and driving himself, um, you know, towards the late 90s. And we ran a team, we ran a rally team. And I traveled around going to the service parks and, you know, helping the mechanics build the cars. And I learned how to use spanners. And what sort of age are you are you here, Karun? Uh, I was a teenager. I was, you know, I was 13, 14, traveling mm-hmm. around India, going to races and rallies. So that, that's where the interest started. And where was this in, in Madras? I, yeah. What, what's called Ch- Chennai now, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, and, and every year we used to have uh, what was called the Madras Grand Prix, where we had a Formula Three race. It was a one-off cameo. And again, you know, my dad used to drive in it early on, and then when he he stopped, we used to get people like, you know, we had Steve Robertson and Warren Hughes and people like that come down from here. And oh, it was really, really funny well. because I, I, ever since I was a kid, I was into it, and I really I read autosport. We never got F1 on TV. The first F1 race that got broadcast was the Spanish Grand Prix in 1993. So. I would have to rely on VHS tapes coming from friends of ours in England. Wow. You know, I would watch the British Grand Prix at Christmas time or something like that. And that was the only way I could soak it up. But That sounds just unbelievable that that it wasn't there until 93. That's incredible. Yeah, well, we didn't have satellite TV <laughs> until 91 or 92. So, and then, uh, you know, we would get order sport, but because the post would come so late, we get it eight <laughs> weeks late. <laughs> it was bizarre. Uh, but, you know, I just soaked it all up. So... When my dad had to make these decisions on which drivers to sign to race in the Madras Grand Prix, you know, I would be helping him make these decisions and I'd be selecting the drivers for him. Wow. And looking back, it's ridiculous because we're talking 90, Warren came in 94, Steve came in 93. You know, I was nine or 10 years old and I'm yeah, choosing yeah. the drivers for our race team. How cool is that? Bonkers. <laughs> and, and did you choose anyone which you then subsequently went, went to race against? You know, in years, in no, years after? No, but... But Warren Warren came back to do some driver coaching for me. Um, you know, he, he's an excellent driver, excellent driver coach who, who never had the opportunity to to race in F1. But I think he he certainly had more speed and talent than his career deserved. Uh, I mean, you raced against him in touring cars. You know, very very good driver and just a nice bloke. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, supremely talented. You know, him and actually Kelvin Burt as well. I mean, they they, they were two content, contemporaries of mine, which actually good enough for F1 without yeah. a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. So yeah, that's where it started, and then you know, I, uh, but we had no go karting. That that's the problem. Um, that was the problem back then. We had no. I've never done a go kart race in my life. So, the first race I did, we had a little single seater with an eight hundred cc engine, standard four speed gearbox, sort of like your Formula First that mm-hmm. I guess you had in the UK, and that was my first steps into racing. Uh, I raced in that, and I raced in a saloon car championship with a Suzuki Swift when I was sixteen, and. Um, and that was it. So, um, you know, went to race in Asia for a year and then came to the UK when I turned 18 and never left. To have been involved in motorsport through your family and obviously, as you say, as a young age, being heavily involved, picking the drivers with your dad, etc. Then to get into racing makes total sense. But to make that step from early racing in a Suzuki Swift or whatever you're saying to actually Formula One is a phenomenal leap. Yeah. Were you single minded at that point that that was where you were going to get to? Did you have your eyes on Formula One from a very early age? 100%. Um, and I think you have to. And, you know, call it naive, call it optimism, you know, youthful op- optimism, I guess. Mm-hmm. But you have to believe in this dream. And I, I, listen, I got very lucky, as, you know, as Jason well and truly knows, it, you need to have the certain key moments where a certain sponsor has to come in at the right time, a certain deal has to happen at the right time and and doors will open. You know, there were several points along the way where I ran out of money and couldn't carry on. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I think there was a key point in 2006, I'd won the Asian championship, but had no money. And and basically I was going to take a job as a team manager for a mates Formula 3 team. Uh, I knew I wanted to carry on working in the business and I I was going to take a job as a team manager. And, it just happened that Red Bull were, you know, looking to 
have some other drivers in F2 uh, and they wanted uh, an Asian driver on their, their driver lineup. And next thing I know, they, they put in half the budget for me to do GP2, wow. uh, as it was called at the time. And, you know, I had I had a bit of time to scramble another half budget and away we went. And and that, that was it. That kept me going, you know. I, mm. And um, so, yeah, listen, it, it's it was tough. And certainly coming from a country like India, where where. The, the money isn't flowing into the sport and you know the things like the currency exchange rate really hit us quite badly and continue to hit us quite badly it's um you know it's not a coincidence that we've got 1.2 billion people and two formula one drivers <laughs> um, you know it, it it really is kind of against the odds um and you know for me even making it to F1 for me was is a big thing, you know, coming especially coming from India. It's massive. It's huge, mate. It's huge. You, you know, if you look at the landscape in the UK to the level of motorsport from right the way down the bottom and, and how it's put together and how, you know, it's televised, it's, it's professional. And then you think about where you've come from. Mate, that's a remarkable achievement. And, and you know, going to places like Le Mans, right, which frankly nobody in India had even really heard of, probably I could count, you know, maybe a hundred people had heard of Le Mans uh, before I went there. And to be the first from your country to do something is, you know, I remember yeah. going to Le Mans and I'm not, a, you know, Jason, you know, I'm not a particularly emotional person, but. Oh, I've standing, seen you cry a few times. You haven't really. It's only when you're driving me around. Look, right, I was when, coming to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but standing on the grid at Le Mans, they're pretty, it's pretty cool because they play the national anthem of every driver on the grid. And for mm -hmm. whatever reason, in 2012, they play the Indian national anthem first that day. And I, I had a, you know, proper goosebumps. We had, Good it lad. was the first time in Indian racing at Le Mans. There were 30 odd journalists had come over and it, it was a big deal. And um, I remember in the race, you know, I went out of the pits and you sort of go through a Dunlockers. And I remember looking to the right, there's a campsite with a whole load of Indian flags. And it was a miserable year. It had rained all week. But I just thought to myself, you know, those people have come and stayed in the piss wet mud <laughs> in a tent <laughs> to watch me race. And it's pretty, it pretty cool. So yeah. motor racing, I think in general, for every 10 days, you have nine pretty crappy ones. But those <laughs> one good ones that you have they they make up for the other nine you know the the joy you get from that one makes up for the other nine crappy ones and and yeah so i think on balance i i don't have much to complain about really back to road cars what was your first ever road car oh you like this so you know i said my dad ran a rally team well yeah we, at the end of the season there was a one of the rally cars he took out the roll cage so it still mm -hmm. had all the holes in it and put the seats back and put a bit of lining into it. And um, for some reason, they they had some gold paint. So they painted it gold. I had gold. <laughs> one of the mechanics decided he put the, you know, those gold wire sort of BBS wheels that you used to get. Yeah, in yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to have them on a Mark II Golf GTI. Well, there you oh, go. I, I had a gold Suzuki Swift with gold BBS wheels. It was nice. horrendous. May I bet you thought you were mint. <laughs> I thought it was the best thing ever because I managed to blag a uh, one of their sort of Group A close ratio gearboxes in it, and uh, I just thought that was the best thing ever. <laughs> but yeah, that was the first thing I had. But and then when I came to England, um. I, you know, I, I didn't have anything. So on the we on the way back from Pembury, my first day of testing was at Pembury in February. And as we were driving back, one of the the guys in the team arranged for me to meet a second-hand car dealer at a services on the M4. And uh, we we bought this Vauxhall Vectra. I still remember the, the registration. It was R363BBH. It was an R-Reg 97 Vectra, two-liter Vectra. Um, uh, and so we go home anyway. The next, it was dark, right? By that point, it's February, coming back from in the evening. Next morning, we wake up. My dad and I look out the window. And he looks at it. He says, "Every panel on that car has got a different <laughs> color." <laughs> and honestly, it was a range of you know pinks, reds, and oranges. It was. Uh, and do you remember how much you paid for it? Three thousand four hundred. Oh my god! Big wow, money. that's a lot. I know it's big cash. It's big cash. 
and uh it was horrendous so then so anyway we, we wanted to look at it it's like oh god look, yeah. but we also that was the first day we'd heard of a shop called ikea because i'd never even heard of it yeah and the mechanics i was like we got this house got no furniture and they said oh yeah you should go to this place called ikea so we go down there and we we load up you know my dad's driving i'm in the back seat the, the wardrobe's over my head over the <laughs> seat. and i went okay i'm in i'm in you know i'm sort of crouched underneath and he slammed the boot. As he slammed the boot, the wardrobe went through the front windscreen. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. God. Oh, God. So, um, See, they're great, great memories, aren't they? They're great days. Brilliant. Oh, no, yeah. great days. I mean, we, we, you know, we bought this idiotic, because we had no idea that we had to assemble it all ourselves and how painful it would be. <laughs> we bought a futon with about 50 slats of wood. <laughs> and we spent three days assembling this stupid thing. A futon. Uh, Do you remember those days? The futons. Yeah. futons. <laughs> futons were big in the nineties yeah. and the early they were. 2000s, they weren't were. they? Lots yeah, of people yeah. had a so futon. This was 2000, 2002. Um, yeah. But yeah, mad, mad times. Yeah, they were big then. Um, answer me this, Karen. A lot of people don't realize that Leyland is still a big name in India. Is that correct? Am I right in yep. thinking that actually a lot of the British Leyland, the jigs and the old the old factory stuff actually went out to India and they carried on making a lot of the Leyland cars way beyond where they stopped in this country? I don't know about the cars. Certainly the trucks they did, uh, and they still do. So it's a brand called Ashok Leyland, um, mm. which is still the biggest, biggest truck manufacturer, I think, uh, okay. in India. So, yeah, um, you know, certainly there's quite an influence, right? When my, uh, you know, when my uh, granddad started racing in the 60s, obviously the, the, you know, the British left India in 1947, but mm. there was still a load of Brits dotted around. Mm. And when they started leaving, they started selling their cars off to the locals before they flew back. You know, so my, I remember my granddad bought a Fraser Nash from somebody. They bought, you know, there was a, an old Jag that he bought from someone. And, and these were people who were just wanting yeah. to get rid of their cars Even, cheap yeah. before they could fly back. Was it the Morris Oxford that was the taxi of the time? Yeah, the, it was called the Ambassador. Okay, but it was essentially a Morris Oxford, wasn't it? Exactly, exactly that. And I think they only stopped producing it in probably about 10 years ago. But, you mm. know, it had the bench seats for the front yeah. and the back. And you <laughs> yeah. could get, you could get, you know, four in the front. You get eight people in this car. But yeah, no, it had the, you know, the gear lever on, a, on, a, on the sort of stick like an indicator stick, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, hilarious things. I'm sure I've driven a Morris Oxford or maybe even a Westminster at Goodwood at the Revival. You must have driven some old knackers like that, have you? Well, I mean, I've driven the Ambassadors a lot. We, we used to do this thing with a, because the handbrake, so the gear lever was up on the stick, but the handbrake was down on the floor. So we used to do this trick where, you know, one of us would sit in the footwell or the passenger side and the other one would be driving it. And they, so you couldn't see, and they go... Pull and you, you know, the one on the floor <laughs> would pull the handbrake, and we do this sort of handbrake turns with these things. It's hilarious. Um, but yeah, listen, you know, you and I both enjoy going to Goodwood. I mean, we drive all sorts yeah. of fun old things and um, all sorts of minis to Can Am cars to Cobras. Hey, come on, I I I'll be super honest now for, for you, Dave. Um, honest to God, when I do the TT, uh, and I mainly do it in a good pal, pal of mine in his big block Corvette Stingray, mm -hmm. honestly, it properly scares me. Does it? Yeah, oh yeah. How about you, Kron? Yeah, I think, you know, um, Jason and I had a really good race in a mini in Minis, 2013, yeah. wasn't it? We had a yeah. really good race. You were in James Martin's car, and I was um, in Sherry Swift, Swift. Yeah. And and that was great fun. And yeah. you're not afraid of it because, you know, it's, they're minis and they're, they're mm. fun. But you're absolutely right. Once you get into bigger things, you know, I think we, we've all gotten used to slightly sanitized circuits and cars with modern tires and grip and, <laughs> and a bit of downforce and things yeah. like that. And suddenly those things. Um, and, and the trouble is you, you arrive at the racetrack with all the right intentions of, yeah, 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 we're going to be careful and we're not going to push it. We'll take it easy. Then you put the helmet on and the red vest comes down <laughs> and we all behave like idiots. So, um, But yeah. is there a difference between, for example, if you're racing, racing, and you're in a factory car, a team car, whatever it is, and obviously if collisions happen, collisions happen, and it's all part of racing. If you're racing in somebody else's pride and joy, you're in James Martin's Mini, you're in Swifty's Mini, whatever it might be, do you pull back slightly because you don't want to bend it and you don't want to come in with a couple of wing mirrors missing? 100%. 
Yeah, no, hundred percent. Listen, the the first objective for any of us doing these things is to get the car back in one piece, right? Yeah, and that's. I think we're we're all very respectful of the fact that it's it's fun weekend. So, you do keep it within your limits, but you know you have to remember these cars are nineteen sixties cars. Okay, some you know a lot of them have been modified with bits and pieces, but deep down they're nineteen sixties cars. And yeah. Goodwood is a nineteen sixties racetrack. You know, it mm. hasn't changed. Yeah. So and it, it's going to hurt. Yeah, you know, if you if you go off, you are going to hit something. So you do have to be incredibly respectful of the circuit as well. I mean, the Can Am car I drove in 2019 when I won the Whitson Trophy, we were doing 176 mile an hour in that thing. Why were you wow. doing that? That's ridiculous, man. Well, now looking back at it, yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you you do, don't you? And you you just. You, you, you're trying to be quick in anything you drive, and that's just that's just so ingrained in us. When we go off and do the fifth gear filming days, it's the same thing. It's just ingrained in us that we're trying to drive as quickly as possible. Um, you know, part of it is because you know the person in the passenger seat is absolutely hating it, and it's very funny. <laughs> that's so true, isn't it? Um, but I think a big part of it is it's just it's just ingrained in us. You mentioned fifth gear there, uh, fifth gear recharge, which is currently on our screens as we speak. As somebody who is without doubt a dyed in the wool petrol head, has it been an adjustment to get your head around obviously new technology, new types of car going forward, as in electric vehicles? I think less for me than it has for the other presenters, to be honest, because really? I raced in Formula E because I, course, I did yeah, a season yeah. of Formula E, and you know mm -hmm. I had that reset back then and um so yeah i, I think it, it where it's still difficult is you know thinking in terms of kilowatts and you know thinking in terms of just it's a different it's a different metric isn't it by the way we yeah. judge what makes a good car and what what isn't a good car you know there's only so many times you can jump in these things and say woohoo they all accelerate quickly because they all do because they're electric yeah. And then you have to kind of have a reset of okay, what is the differentiator? What what makes one electric car better than the other? It's quite tricky, isn't it, to find to find the, the you know that you know, the character of these cars because they are, you know, they don't have it. They don't have the, what an engine gives you in terms of feel and sound and all these sorts of other um, senses you get. They're, they're gone, and it does make them kind of the same so it's quite tricky are they functional is that the word for a lot of these cars you know they do what they do well but as you're implying jason they don't have that character they don't necessarily give you that emotion well i think i think the the very very new ones now the manufacturers have learned how to put character into to them so you know if you if you go back like two three years they were all a bit dull to be honest mm. And I think you know I, I did a, a, a I spent two days in a in a, the Kia EV6 um, in Germany, and you know what I loved it. And oh, it was I great. saw that. I saw that one. Yes, yes, it was yes. Really, really, it was really great. And I, I, you know, to answer your quite quite question earlier, I I was very skeptical of the of the mm. EV thing. Didn't like it. Bit of an old dinosaur. Want a V8? Yada yada yada. So I've been on this this journey, this kind of discovery. And you know what? I, I, I'm nearly there actually. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've heard you talk about this before. You'd have one, wouldn't you? Not necessarily as your only car, but you'd certainly have one as one of your two cars, perhaps. Absolutely. And I think the next car we have, you know, the, the family car for, for, well, I say the family car for Soph, um, uh, uh, you know, for school runs and mm. nipping around town and all that stuff. I, I, honestly, I think we're going to go electric. I, I think we're the same. I think uh, it won't be our only sort of option at home. I think we'll still have one IC e car, but yeah, certainly as a second car. Mm. No, you know my, you know my wife's car has done. I, I jumped in it this morning, just moving around the drive, and it's done <laughs> seven thousand miles in, you know, two and a half years. Mm. And she doesn't do the mileage, so yeah. it, it really an electric car will be absolutely fine as a second car. And yeah. if you look at the numbers, what it costs, if it's, this is on the assumption that you, you plug it in at home, you charge it at home. I mean, it's it's peanuts to run the things. Yeah, well, this this is a thing because I think the perception is always that electric cars are expensive and arguably too expensive, and I think that's the big barrier to entry for a lot of people. But as you say, and this is why this is why the current series of fifth gear recharge have been so good, is that when you look at those things and you sort of say, right, well, the electric equivalent of this particular car is two and a half thousand pounds more than its petrol equivalent. However, when you do the running cost maths, it all comes down, and surely that is a 
an investment worth having in the long term over certainly three or five years. But that conversation we've just had and what you've just said completely underlines the fact that electric cars are functional and don't have emotional appeal or soul yeah. in the ways that the ICE cars. And I think that is a, a, a real consideration for motor racing. You know, I, I I think back to going to the, you know, standing on the, the grass banks of watching, you know, I came from India in 1996 to watch a touring car race at Silverstone. I stood at Cops yeah. Corner and watched all these guys driving around. And even the sound of a touring car, let alone the screaming mm. V10s of an F1 car, made it exciting to someone, mm. you know, who's 10, 12 years old watching that. Yeah. And, you know, you think in F1, when we used to be able to hear the cars seven, eight miles away. <laughs> I, li- I used to live in Brackley and I could hear testing happening at Silverstone. You know, that's eight yeah. miles away. Yeah. And that creates some emotional yeah. feeling yeah. in your stomach, doesn't it? That you think, yeah. holy smoke, what is that? I want to go see it. There's that mm. great line, isn't it? And the line is, we sell noise. Yeah. And, and I think to me, that's such an important ingredient of the passion involved in motor racing for the mm. fans is the sound of the cars. Do you remember the pushback when Formula One went really quiet in the first year of the turbo car, uh, you know, the, the, the turbo cars? It was yeah. awful, awful, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, they're not actually that much different now, but people mm. have got used to it. Um, I, I, and this is why I think, you know, F1 needs to have a little bit of a think, and the FIA needs to have a little bit of a think about the future direction uh, of Formula One. My personal opinion, and it, it's probably not a popular one with manufacturers, is that we should... Uh, get rid of the hybrids. We shouldn't be hybrid anymore. I think F1, the reality is with the way they the rules work, right? You know, you set a, uh, set a set of regulations and they're in place then for four or five years. The trouble is in that four or five years, the road car industry is now plowing so much money into R&D and research. F1 is no longer really the leader in terms of research into the hybrids or the battery technology, point A. Point B, the, the energy recovery system that works on the MGUH, which is the turbo system, you'll never, ever put that on a road car yeah. because it only works if you're driving flat out at full throttle or it works most efficiently at full throttle, I should say. Yeah. So Which you don't do on the road. So you'll never have that crossover from F1 to the road car industry anyway. Mm. So to me, we should now with Le Mans and LMDH and all that you know hybrid development happening with new manufacturers coming into Le Mans and sports cars, they should do hybrids and battery development in sports car racing and f1 should do synthetic and biofuels and look for what happens next because i think i think you can get rid of the battery and all of the other hybrid stuff you'll save 120 kilos of weight it'll be better for the tires it'll create better racing the cars will be lighter and more agile Mm. i think you'll have the opportunity to go back to a v8 or a v10 screaming loud engines Mm. trying to run on biofuels which will sound amazing and look amazing so to me you know uh, it probably won't happen because the manufacturers don't want it to happen but that's what i would like to see for 2026 what they don't want they don't want biofuels to come in as a legitimate alternative to battery technology no they don't want to get to the hybrids they Ah. they they, they okay. want to keep it as hybrid because they see that as being the crossover. But I, I'm not convinced. But it's true that they're putting a lot of effort into into e-fuel, aren't they? Into synthetic. Yeah, exactly. And I think they're scared to commit. And the feeling I get is that F1 and the manufacturers around F1 are, are scared to fully say goodbye to hybrid technology um, mm. because they still see that as an important part of the future. But here's a question for you. So in terms of manufacturers, we heard recently that Audi had stated that they were going to make no more combustion engines from whatever date and obviously focus their attentions on electric vehicles. If synthetic fuels are to be a viable way forward, then is that not a bit of a change in direction in itself? Because surely biofuels are going to be reliant upon the normal combustion engine technology. So, you know, to actually make that statement now in 2021, it's almost a bit like, well, we're either going to take this path or this path. And surely you can't take both. Well, they can, can't they? Because if you look at across the group, Mm. you've got multiple brands. So they could easily say, we're going to send Audi down this path or then Porsche yeah. down that path and okay. you know, Volkswagen on that path and Skoda yeah. and Seat. And- well, that's what's happening, is it? Porsche are putting a lot of a lot of investment into e-fuel. Yeah, and 
To be honest, uh, what I don't like, and you know, I heard a really good podcast from Andy Palmer, uh, the former boss of Aston Martin and Nissan, mm-hmm. and he made a really good point, which is the future direction of what all of us are driving shouldn't be dictated by the government. Mm. It should be dictated by technology. And what he means is, if the governments are all saying by 2030, 35, 40, whatever, right, all the different governments around the world are coming up with a number, we'll all go, we should be all driving electric cars. Mm-hmm. That's wrong. What they should be saying is by these dates, the emission numbers should be mm-hmm. this low. Now, all of you go off and create whatever ways yes. to achieve those numbers. Because yeah. otherwise, what you're effectively doing is forcing all of the engineering minds into going into this electric pathway to achieve the targets set by the governments yeah. instead of allowing creativity to come up with other yeah. better ways. And I, I yeah. thought that's a, that's a really interesting point that Andy made. Yeah, I mean, there, I mean, there is one big hurdle to all this, this electric thing. And, and Paddy Lowe's come up with this concept, and that is the energy density of batteries is so not even on the same it's not even in the same book let alone the same page or chapter as hydrocarbons uh, so uh, effectively things like aircraft will never ever ever be electric unless there's a monumental change in technology and that's so many years away i mean that could be 50 years away it's certainly not around the corner so there's still going to be a need for hydrocarbon style fuel with mm-hmm. massive energy uh, density and that means we've got to go e-fuel and and boats i mean boats won't ever be battery so it, i'm with you karun they've got to they've got to stop driving the manufacturers in one direction they've got to allow them to come up with new new tech and i think in some ways right i think governments have you know they've picked c- cars and mobility as a, a, a as kind of a, a showcase or of you know let's make an example out of how we're going to go green with the cars and and that world don't get me wrong we all absolutely need to be doing things to make the yeah. world a, a greener place but what about gas central heating you know you just need to look at the stats coming out of the emissions from from that yeah. you you just you look at you mentioned boats you know the emissions coming out of the mm. container boats and the stuff they dump in the oceans yeah. it's Unbelievable. If you look at the emissions, from, and they're all getting greener, you know, aircraft engines are getting greener all the time. But the emissions from one Atlantic crossing on one of those, you know, massive aircrafts is colossal compared to what a Renault Clio is going <laughs> to yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Very true, and I think, and I think um, you know, in some ways, I do think the road car industry is, and or the, the automotive industry, should I say, has been an easier thing for people to pick on in uh, easy table. target isn't it yeah um before we let you go and unpack your bag from abu dhabi because i'm conscious <laughs> that you've not long got home <laughs> he's gonna have sand what? in his knickers he's gonna have sand in his knickers he's gonna have to like rinse off his flip-flops and all that kind of stuff before we do that karun a couple of questions that we like to ask all of our guests here on fueling around and here's one for you of all of the cars you've ever owned you need to pick one and one only and stick with it for the rest of your life which one is it and why? It's going to be a very boring answer, but I had a um, Audi A6 estate with a three liter twin turbo engine. Yeah. And that was just the best. It was so, it, it's practical, but it, it was, it's an estate. I could put my bikes, all the kids stuff. It like, mm. it, it was the, and it's just a great car. You could cruise along at uh, 74 miles an hour, <laughs> <laughs> if you wanted to. You uh, lie and get. Yeah, 77, it, it, I know it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you're braver than me. But uh, yeah, no, that, that, that was it. It's just a, just a great car, great road car. Good choice. Wow. Good choice. It is a good choice. So another question we like is music and cars go together. If you could choose any car, and it can be whatever you like, where are you going to go to? Where are you going to drive and what are you going to listen to? So any car would have to be an F40. Um, that's, okay. the, that's the poster I had on my wall as a kid growing mm-hmm. up. Um, I would probably do, um, what drive would I do? Something like Stelvio Pass, something like that, because yeah, you know you right. want to do it in Italy. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I would, 
It's funny, you know. I've gone, I've gone off having music in the car for the last three years. I, I am a, I'm a podcast and audiobook person now. I've um... is the right answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, he's good, isn't he? Isn't he good? He's very good. He's very good. Yeah, I mean that that's not only because of you two. It's genuinely a thing. I've, um, I've sort of, yeah. Do you know what? I'm a bit the same actually. I used to want big speakers in my car and all that sort of stuff. But the last, I reckon about the same last three years, I, I like listening to pe people. Mm. And, and you know, you know what put me onto audiobooks was actually doing fifth year because we'd have these shoots up in places like Anglesey or in yeah. Landown, Wales. And I go, hang on a second. I can listen to nonsense on the radio or listen to LBC like Jason does and come here with all his political opinions. <laughs> <laughs> or anger, anger. <laughs> and anger. Um, or I could actually basically read a book and you i think a lot of it comes we just don't have time to sit down and read a book anymore yeah. in life yeah and um yeah i saw when we were doing the fifth year shows i started doing audio books and i just saw it's just a great way for me to get my reading done it's just a far better use of time isn't it as you say you know because that's they're dead hours especially if you're driving to anglesey and back i mean what's that five hours each way probably depending on yeah, where you live yeah i'm waiting for you to get your heli sorted jace you know oh those days are long gone mate they're long gone <laughs> Anyway, and on that on 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 that note, <laughs> that <sad> note <laughs> on Jason's that depressing note, <laughs> on that note, Jason, I think you need to take us out. Well, do you know what, Karina? Mate, I love that, but that's about it for this week's fueling round, powered by Adrian Flux, as the UK's largest specialist insurance broker. Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help you save money on your car, your bike, or even your home insurance. Dave, as always, thanks to you, but a huge thanks to our special guest this week, Mr. Karun Chandler. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, guys. Happy to be here. Thank you very much. Wonderful to get your thoughts on the weekend's action, amongst other things. Don't forget, you can get in touch with us on Twitter at Jason Plato or at David Vitti. And if you've liked what you've heard, feel free to give us a five-star rating, press the subscribe button, and share the podcast on all your socials. Thanks for listening, and um, well, we'll see you next time. Till up. Ta-da!